Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, all. Welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. As always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Grab your free 31 page PDF. Uh, great little study guide, refresher if you're in school, going through pharmacology classes, or if you're out in practice. Uh, just a good refresher on uh, the top 200 drugs and some of the most common uh, clinical pearls that you see on exams, as well as things that you see uh, certainly in, in real practice as well. And then we've got a great price on the MedEd 101 Guide to Nursing Pharmacology. Uh, great kind of cheat sheet notes, uh, much more in depth. We've got questions at the end of each chapter as well to kind of assess your knowledge. Um, a great gift for somebody going through pharmacology classes uh, and or somebody in school uh, trying to uh, get up to speed and learn pharmacology, which I hope certainly this podcast has helped as well. So again, go check out MedEd 101 Guide to Nursing Pharmacology on Amazon. All right, the drug of the day today is prednisolone. Now, I have done prednisone in the past, okay? So that brings up a really, really important point that these two drugs are not the same, um, but there definitely is a lot of similarities. So we'll, we'll talk about that, and I have seen errors come up with prednisolone versus prednisone in clinical practice. So very, very important uh, that I wanted to, to note that right away. So prednisolone, uh, the brand names that I've seen most commonly in clinical practice, uh, Pediapred, Oropred, Milipred, uh, those are, are probably the three most common uh, I've seen there. Uh, it is a systemic corticosteroid, just like prednisone, and ultimately it reduces inflammation, does it by suppressing uh, migration of polymorphonuclear leukocytes and ultimately reduces the action of the lymphatic system as well. So pretty much whenever you see a steroid, corticosteroid used like this, we're using it to reduce inflammation. Okay, that's by and large the most common use that we're going to use these medications for. Uh, another thing with prednisolone, uh, so it is frequently used, the solution liquid in pediatric patients. And this is a really, really important thing for preventing errors and making sure that, you know, from the prescribing side, dispensing side, uh, administering side, if you're a nurse, you've got to make sure that that dosage form is correct because there's multiple different strengths of prednisolone depending upon where you're at in the world. Um, what's available may vary for you. And obviously I don't know every single country and what's available and what's not, but um, there are multiple possible dosage forms depending upon uh, where you live and work. So you can have anywhere from you know five milligrams per mil up to 20 milligrams per mil. So you've got to make sure that we're able to do the math there and uh, do the appropriate calculation for the weight-based weight dosing if we're giving this to a pediatric patient, which we often obviously have to use liquids for pediatric patients because they aren't very good at swallowing uh, pills in some instances, the younger we get generally, of course. All right, utilization. So uh, think about any situation where inflammation may be an issue, particularly acutely. Uh, so asthma exacerbation or acute, you know, respiratory infections where we've got a lot of inflammation going on, that's where you're going to see this drug used, um, uh, itching or dicaria, uh, potentially like allergic reaction type stuff, autoimmune diseases where we've got acute flares, things like that. So pain, inflammation states, 
Uh, and then, of course, you can see it uh, in like transplantation uh, patients as well to prevent acute uh, organ rejection. Administration, this medication is generally given with food. It can cause a little GI upset, so that's generally why we do that. Try to reduce that risk. Um, conversions is something that also comes up between corticosteroids. So uh, as happens uh, in the real world of pharmacy and medication use, you may have a shortage of a particular steroid that if you're a provider that you like to use or if you're a nurse or pharmacist that um, is typically used within your area region and if that's the case uh, and we have a shortage of a particular drug, let's say prednisone for example, uh, we've got to be able to uh, interpret and uh, figure out conversions between uh, different corticosteroids. So pearls.com slash RLP, P-Y-R-L-S dot com slash RLP uh, has a great free resource um, on these conversions between oral systemic uh, corticosteroids. Uh, for our purposes, you know, the most common conversion here is, is prednisone. Uh, that's the most commonly used steroid. And then in my opinion, prednisolone is probably a second Um, That is a one-to-one conversion ratio. Uh, But again, pearls.com slash RLP, they got multiple different steroids on there. Um, Great way to have a quick uh, PDF conversion chart and simply uh, an email uh, will get you access uh, to that free account and that free download. So definitely go take advantage of that at pearls.com slash RLP. Uh, adverse effect profile. So I'm going to kind of separate this out. So you've got acute adverse effects and you've got more chronic adverse effects. So let's talk about the you know immediate things that a patient might notice. So uh, insomnia can definitely happen. Uh, I've seen it really kind of like rev people up where they've got a little bit more energy, stuff like that. And if you're using it for like a, a respiratory infection too, Um, and patients are starting to feel better, they may feel more energetic too. So sometimes, depending upon what we're doing, it's hard to maybe tell if it's the drug, you know, kind of amping people up a little bit, giving them a little bit more energy, maybe not being able to sleep as much, or if it's the uh, potential improvement of their condition that's helping them them feel a little bit better. So sometimes that's challenging to to decipher a little bit, Um, but generally earlier in the day, Uh, is when you're going to want to take this medication because if you take it right before bed and it does cause some insomnia, uh, that's going to uh, not make your patients happy if they're up all night and and not sleeping. Uh, Can definitely increase hunger. I've seen this uh, in in patients uh, for sure. So uh, keep that in mind, particularly in pediatric patients. I've seen that a fair number of times. Uh, GI upset, again, we kind of take it with food to to do that. And I'll mention that in drug interactions to other meds that that might increase GI risk. Uh, Elevations in blood sugars, so that can happen pretty acutely, um, pretty quickly. So keep an eye, particularly on patients with diabetes who maybe had issues with hyperglycemia in the past. Uh, And then it can cause some increases. uh, Usually it's, it's mild to moderate increases in blood pressure usually in, you know, if we're giving prednisolone in a pediatric patient, we're usually not crazy worried about it, but it is something uh, to at least consider there. And then of course, we've got long-term adverse effects with corticosteroids, which this is the primary reason why we really try to avoid using them frequently, avoid using them uh, in high doses, and obviously uh, total avoidance of chronic corticosteroids, systemic corticosteroids, uh, if we can absolutely at all avoid it. So those longer term effects, so HPA suppression, development of, of Cushing's type syndrome, uh, growth in kids can potentially be suppressed. Um, and that obviously, the more and more we use it, that type of thing uh, is going to increase that risk. You know, if you're just talking about a five day course of prednisolone, you know, one time, it's probably not a huge deal. Um, but if you've got a patient that has, you know, several asthma exacerbations and we've got to give this patient, you know, steroids, systemic steroids once a month 
well, first off, I would say we got to get the asthma uh, better under control. We got to figure something out there. But if you have to give steroids, because obviously uh, asthma exacerbation can be a life-threatening situation, if you've got to give steroids once a month for a year, two years, three years, uh, you're putting that patient definitely at significant risk for some of these longer-term issues. So uh, diabetes development, osteoporosis risk, uh, cataract development, and then, of course, immunosuppression. The more and more we use this, you know, we're reducing inflammation. Uh, we're also suppressing the immune system with the use of this. So in chronic, frequent use, uh, we do our best to try to uh, avoid that. And that's always a risk-benefit type of thing um, when we use a steroid like prednisolone. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention quick about kinetics before I get into drug interactions is uh, this drug is broken down by CYP3A4. So talk about that a little bit in drug interactions here after the break. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, and others, go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got a growing list of resources that we update on an annual basis over the last several years, I've added hours and hours of content, updating videos, uh, adding more practice questions, uh, so tons of great content that have really, really helped people uh, pass their board certification exam. So um, go check that out, meded101.com slash store, support the sponsor. Also, if you're a nurse, physician, med student, PA, nurse practitioner, uh, we've got books on case studies, drug interactions, clinical pearls, uh, all those links to our Amazon books, Audible books, uh, you can find at meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, wrapping up with drug interactions. So I mentioned CYP3A4. So naturally, if we've got CYP3A4 inhibitors, which I've talked about uh, numerous times in previous podcasts, so CYP3A4 inhibitors can raise concentrations of prednisolone and inducers can lower concentrations of prednisolone. Uh, GI risk, I alluded to a little bit. So um, my biggest thing here usually is NSAIDs. So increasing GI bleed risk when we use steroids and NSAIDs in combination. Uh, so that's something to definitely look out for and if possible, try to avoid using those together. So keep it, keep tabs on your patients. Ask them if they're taking any over-the-counters, that type of thing. And we might want to try to uh, minimize that use of NSAIDs, uh, if possible, while they're using uh, prednisolone. Uh, one adverse effect that I didn't mention is it can have, uh, prednisolone can have some impacts on potassium hemostasis. Um, particularly, it's going to trend uh, potassium to the lower side. So patients on loop diuretics, for example, we can have some additive effects and potentially we can increase the risk for hypokalemia, low potassium levels. And then with vaccines, I think it's important to recognize that prednisolone does suppress the immune system. Uh, so in patients on higher dosages, longer periods of time, um, when we're using prednisolone uh, concomitantly with vaccine use, there is the possibility of reduced efficacy. And if we're using live vaccines, that's generally considered a no-no. We should not do that. Um, however, it does depend upon the dosing a little bit and that type of thing. So uh, if you're not sure on that, um, my recommendation is usually if you see somebody taking a systemic corticosteroid like prednisolone uh, is to ask questions say are you on this long term is this short term and if it is just short term generally we're going to wait a little bit and then give those vaccines when their course of prednisolone is done now if they're using it for uh, chronic immune system suppression uh, for things like uh, transplantation that type of thing uh, then it's best to obviously get uh, consult involved with the transplant team that's following that patient, um, figure out what we're doing uh, with those immune suppressing agents, and then obviously develop a game plan for uh, giving those vaccines and when would be uh, best to do it there. So um, that's kind of my take. If you see systemic corticosteroids, definitely think about vaccine and vaccine efficacy. 
If it's short term, um, probably just wait a little bit and we'll be good. Uh, if it's longer term, then we've probably got to do some digging and try to figure out uh, what's the best uh, process to give those vaccines, make sure they're effective and safe, of course, as well. And then we've got other immunosuppressive agents that may have additive effects as far as causing drug interactions. Uh, so your tacrolimus, cyclosporin, which in all honesty, we're probably going to be using uh, in consultation with a transplant team, that type of situation. Um, but obviously using more and more immunosuppressives together um, can certainly increase the risk of some malignancies as well as infection. All right, well, that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. I thank you so much for listening. Uh, leave us a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, if you've purchased a book in the past on Amazon, uh, supporting meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E, uh, definitely feel free to, to leave us a, a rating and review on Amazon. I greatly appreciate those of you who have uh, taken the, the time to do that. It helps us reach more people and get more exposure. Uh, share us, email uh, colleagues, friends, students uh, who may benefit from this pharmacology podcast. I greatly appreciate all of you who have taken the time to do that. If you got comments, suggestions, uh, you can reach out to me. Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCPS, BCGP. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the social media platform I'm most active on. You can also track me down by Gmail, mededucation101 at gmail.com. As always, please support the sponsor, mededonecom slash store. Any purchases there go directly to support this podcast and helping us uh, educate more people about the world of pharmacology. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.